It was the 19th century, and the British military didn't exactly rack their brains when they named this immense seac of seven and eight thousand meter peaks. They simply took the K from Karakoram and numbered them K4, K2, K3, K1. 150 years later, out of all those numbers, just one is left. A very easy name for the very hardest mountain, K2. There are several paths up to the summit of K2. These are the most famous. To the right, the Abruzzi Ridge, taken by almost all the expeditions. And to the left, the Magic Line, where hardly anyone dares to ascend. This is the most complicated way up the hardest mountain. Only the Poles made it to the summit back in 1986. All of K2's numbers are even more impressive when compared to Mount Everest. A total of 2,249 climbers have walked on the roof of the world, while only 249 have made it to the summit of K2. If climbers who reach Mount Everest summit touch the sky, those who reach K2 summit touch the sky and win it. This is the route of one of the world's most spectacular treks. It starts at Skardu, which we can reach by plane. It ends 10 days later at the K2 base camp. We'll cover the first kilometers by car, accompanied by the persistent honking of horns by the locals. The road can seem a bit narrow depending on your speed, but it's a true luxury, particularly if we compare it to the last few kilometers of roadway. Now there's a road from Skardu to Ascoli, the last town. But in the past, these 60 kilometers that we've just covered by car were done on foot. We arranged to meet with the Balti porters in Ascoli. The porters will help us with the 1,500 kilograms of materials required for the expedition. It is one of the most spectacular treks in the world due to the high concentration of massive mountains which we'll see along the way. First example, in the background, to the right, Uli Biao, a 6,200 meter peak. Second example, the Baltoro Cathedrals, 6,400 meters high. We are near the Baltoro ice field at the source of the Braldo River. The river rushes down fast and furious and very murky as it drags along everything in its path. We've already crossed it a couple of times before. The trek is a bit tough, but it's within the reach of anyone who's had experience in high altitude hiking. In addition to the landscape, there are two things that stand out. One good, one bad. The good part is that you only climb 300 meters every day, so getting your body used to the elevation is no problem. Chapati good. Chapati. Onion, good, very good. The bad part is the temperature variation. The difference between night and day can reach 40 degrees Celsius. The porters are about to finish their trek, but before that we'll see Geyserbrum 4, which barely missed being included in the Great 14, and K2 itself, which as always is shrouded in clouds. Last year was a very special year for this base camp. It had never been so busy here. A total of 13 expeditions from a number of countries wanted to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first expedition, which was Italian. With 35 mountaineers, the Italian group was the largest. But oddly enough, none of its members attended the 50th anniversary celebration, a symptom that the controversy that surrounds that first ascent continues to this day. One of the first obstacles on the magic line is the Filippo ice field, a dangerous landscape full of cracks and crevasses, not always easy to see. The reward for this effort is our arrival at the Negrotto Pass. Bueno, hoy es un día clave. 
señor. Sí, señor. Sí, señor ¿eh? ¿Lo vas asegurando? Disfrutan, sí. The danger is ever present, never too far away. Ha sortit el sol. Estem pujant cap al Coll Negroto. El Golam, el Manel, el Valen, el Jordi. El Manel i el Jordi estan més amunt. El Golam i jo estem aquí. Given the higher risk of avalanches, they decide to cross the Filippo ice field and reach Camp 1 by night. It will be one of the hardest parts of the entire climb. The weather gave no quarter to anybody, least of all to the only mountaineers who were attempting to ascend the magic line. It took the Catalans a month to reach this camp. K2 has another 8,000 meter peak right in front, Broad Peak, which is shaped like a dragon's tail. A perfect climb for a wonderful day. Blue skies, no wind. There are very few days like this on K2. The climbers have to make the most of it. After five attempts, they finally make it to Camp 1. Hello, 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 which come over? How are you, Jalal? How are your trip, over? We descend to the base camp to visit the Catalan expedition's hotel. For two months, these esplanades are dotted by tiny villages where the best mountaineers live together for a long time. They're usually set up at about 5,000 meters, an elevation that lets you rest after installing camps higher up the slopes or after attacking the summit. That's why it's a good idea to descend every once in a while and also to get a proper meal. The base camp is like home, where you do everyday things. You can take advantage of the downtime to get some paperwork done or to study the clouds and wind as you await a good weather window. Thanks to new technologies, these base camps are connected to the rest of the world. Since we're talking about the weather, take a look at the next shots. The weather at K2 was like this, 60% of the time. In spite of the poor weather, the job of equipping camps one and two must not stop. Now they can work by day. Only people in love with high altitude climbing can feel good in such a place. And only the best prepared people in love can aspire to cross the magic line. The bad weather is one of the biggest difficulties of K2, a lonely 8,000 meter mammoth surrounded by clouds, snow and wind. Lots of wind. After the storm, one would expect calm, but K2 continues to surprise the expedition members with its range of threats. Manel, ¿qué dios? Manel de la Mata was higher up, opening the way, when suddenly... Manel. Manel. Manel, 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 and finally the reunion. 
After the tense moments, we go down to the base camp to experience far more pleasant ones. The head of the expedition, Oscar Kadiak, is visited by his daughters, Oda and Julia. Oda is 20 years old, and she was the first gift Oscar got after climbing Mount Everest. Julia was born two years later. More guests. They're also visited by Kurt Dienberger, who's 72 years old. He's got a number of 8,000s under his belt, and in 1957, he was the first to reach the summit of Broad Peak. He was one of the few mountaineers who made it alive down from the summit of K2 during that terrible summer of 86. Let's hear a few more international tributes to this Catalan magic line ascent. Sir Chris Bonington is a piece of living Himalayan history. If Dienberger likes Montserrat, Bonington is particularly fond of the rock walls that surround Tivisa in the Ribera d'Ebre region of southern Catalonia. He often goes there to climb with his friend, Oscar Cariac. When he speaks of the Himalayas and the Karakoram, Sir Chris Bonington is a true authority. Well, I mean, I, don't, I certainly wouldn't want to do it. Uh, it must, I think it must get very tedious and very tiring, but having said that, it's a very real achievement. To actually go and climb the 14, 8,000 meter peaks requires a lot of determination, a very high level of mountaineering ability, and quite a few people, of course, have lost their lives doing it. But to me, it seems a waste of time because they end up just repeating routes that have already been climbed. And to me, uh, climbing is actually about exploration. It's about doing new routes. It's climbing unclimbed peaks or lines that haven't been climbed before. Bonington's experience at Ogre Peak in 1977 moved the world. After making it to the summit, his companion broke both legs and he suffered a number of cracked ribs. They dragged themselves down to the base camp six days later. They didn't find anyone there. Everybody had given them up for dead. I believe that um, Alpin, the future of alpinism is as it always has been, is in actually climbing new routes. And there are literally hundreds of unclimbed peaks of 5,000 and 6,000 meters in the Himalayas. There's many, many unclimbed faces on the 7,000 meter peaks. And I see the, the young, talented climbers more and more going, climbing alpine style in the purest kind of way on these very challenging climbs. And I think that's the future of alpinism. We are back at K2. Technically speaking, the route from Camp 1 to Camp 2 is one of the most complicated of all. But because of the bad weather, they've been up and down the trail so many times that it's all covered with fixed lines. Here you will see how the mountaineers begin to spend less time talking and more time breathing, a sure sign that they're up around 7,000 meters. Look at that. That fine line which can be seen on the horizon is the so-called ghost effect, the shadow of K2 projecting to the sky and onto Broad Peak. Hanging crack is a grade six crack, the last difficulty before setting up Camp 2, which was named the Eagle's Nest.
Towards the end of July, they get a surprising window of good weather, which lasts two days. At K2, that's truly remarkable. The team sets up the equipment between camps two and three. This part is technically difficult, but less perilous because there are no avalanches here. These days, they learn that female Basque mountaineer, Edurne Passavan, has managed to give a woman's touch to a sport that is often too male. Now comes the most complicated, decisive part of the magic line. The attack line formed by Oscar Cadillac, Manel de la Mata and Jordi Corominas has reached 7,500 meters where they find K2's last esplanade, the pulpit. The pulpit is the last place before the peak where one can rest in relative comfort and the last place where Oscar Cadillac can tape a panoramic view like this one. From here on, everything's vertical, but that's not the biggest danger the three Catalan climbers face. Their main adversary comes in the form of a number. They've gone past the 8,000 meter mark and they're now in the dead zone. Here the oxygen content of the air is down to only 20% and it's eight times harder to make any movement at all. Here's how they start up the chute that ends at the Casa Rotto Tower named after the vanished Italian mountaineer. It's one of the most complicated parts of the ascent. Besides, they've been climbing for six consecutive days now. They have to set up a camp, no matter what it takes, before trying to go for the peak. Mission accomplished. Now we've got a tent for the daytime and for the nighttime. The 16th of August 2004, they've spent the night at 8,100 meters. The moment of truth has arrived. The three mountaineers leave the tent at 4 a.m. A little while later, at 8,300 meters, Oscar Cadillac begins to feel ill and starts to descend. Manel de la Mata also abandons a few minutes later, but Jordi Corominas decides to continue alone. He talked to the base camp just before reaching the summit. Let's listen. Twenty-four hours opening a path alone, fighting through waist-high snow, Jordi Corominas made it to the world's hardest summit at night, and he didn't stop even for a minute. The mounted climbers who make it up to K2 never celebrate at the summit because they know that the descent is where most of the fatal accidents take place. While Oscar Cadillac and Manel de la Mata descended the tough magic line, Jordi Corominas left the peak following the Abruzzi Ridge. It was pitch dark. He was all alone and he had a terrible time finding an unfamiliar way down. Farther down on safer ground, he met up with a Japanese expedition and then rejoined his companions at the base camp. Meanwhile, the climb down the magic line became harder and harder for the other two mountaineers. In the end, 
Cadillac and De La Mata managed to make it back to Camp One. On the 19th of August, with Oscar Cadillac by his side, Manil de la Mata died from peritonitis. His body is now buried at the foot of K2. The Balti porters, punctual as always, are at the base camp to help on a particularly hard and sad return trek. <laughs> 